years. So what made you decide to join the Army? Well, my girlfriend and I were in town one day and we saw this notice, uh, 500 ladies wanted to join the Signal Corps. And we thought, oh well, we'll do that. So we went in and signed and went home and told our parents. Actually, I think they were glad to get rid of us. They were a bit shocked, but um, they said okay. And then we went into Ingleburn Rookies Camp in the July, the 7th of July. And uh, that was quite exciting for us. So that's where you were stationed? At Ingleburn, we were stationed at Ingleburn to do our three months rookie course. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually we only did about six weeks and we were sent up to Chermside mm -hmm. where we worked in a dugout that was under the ground and we had to go down in steps to get to it in a big ladder. Uh, that was our first experience into being in the world really, is starting out on a real job for the Army. And did I go on from there? Yeah. And from there we went with our volunteers to go to Townsville, so we went to Townsville in the uh, end of 42 and we were there for about 12 months where well, we worked in town until they sent us out to Stewart Creek and it was in a little school there, there was only about four of us worked in it and eventually they built a big sea office which was tunnelled into the hill and uh, we worked in that for about, oh, about 12 months and then we were sent to Cairns and Atherton mm -hmm. and then later on after that we were sent to New Guinea. And, uh, it was very exciting going on to the Duntroon because it was just on the wharf, it was just a sea of khaki, men and women, all waiting. And we waited and waited and waited like the army makes you wait. And the Red Cross came around and gave us all uh, drinks and, and something to eat while we were waiting. And then we all piled onto the Duntroon and uh, we sailed and we had four escort ships escorting us over there and it was just a very vivid thing for us to be going over women for the first contingent to ever leave Australia to serve in the war. So that was quite exciting. Did you see, um, did the men treat you any differently? Were there men there that thought you shouldn't be there or? Well when we first went to New Guinea they had the wrong impression of why we were up there and our superior officer had to cancel all leave for about two weeks to tell them exactly why we were there. We weren't there for any other reasons like they thought we were there for. What reasons? Oh, they thought we were just up there to entertain the troops, I think. <laughs> but okay. she had to put them straight and said there were no, no leave till this is all sorted out and the girls are here to work, not to play. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, well, I joined the Army because well, I was born in a um, very small country town and uh, when the war broke out, it, everyone was so patriotic, they were rushing, rushing to join up. So uh, the adventure, of course, too, and um, we couldn't, couldn't get away quickly enough. I joined up when I was 17, but I had to wait until I was 18 before they called me up. and. Uh, I did my Rockies in um, Ingleburn in Sydney for six weeks and uh, then I was stationed at, uh, uh, in Sydney at Victoria Barracks for a little while and then Newcastle at uh, 2 L of C they call it, uh, second uh, line of communication at Newcastle and I was there for about six months and then I was stationed in uh, Brisbane until the end of the war. And um, it was very exciting in Brisbane. There were masses and masses of troops, all different nationalities, different colour uniforms. And uh, it was a very interesting time. Um, I don't know if there's anything more I can say. Right. Was there any vivid um, memory or particular day or anything that happened during your Oh, time? yes, being uh, nearly run over by De General Douglas MacArthur. Okay. <laughs> He got a bigger fright than I did, I think. <laughs> All I could do was step back from the pavement and salute him. <laughs> His driver got into trouble. 
tell us that story. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was up in in Spring Hill at the time, and uh, I was uh, right on the edge of a, a street, and uh, I went to step off the curb, and because he, he was buzzing everywhere at the time, sometimes he had his wife and little boy with him, but this day he was uh, on his own. I stepped on, I stepped out from the curb uh, right in front of him and I didn't see him because he came around the corner so quickly and uh, he just, uh, fortunately the driver saw me and pulled up and uh, he, he came forward in his seat, he got a fright and uh, all I could do was salute him. I stepped back and salute him. Yeah, that's all I could do and he saluted me back too. Same as Norma, I joined when I was 17 and I had to wait till January when I turned 18. And then, uh, this is in Victoria, and I did my rookies down at um, Mornington Peninsula. Um, and then I was put into Army Records, which covered the whole of service personnel of Victoria, men, women, nurses, uh, not Air Force or Navy, just purely Army, and also internees, people that have lived here for years and they were interned because they suddenly became the enemy. We had all their records and um, it, it was a very, we were in the, the basement of Myers in Lonsdale Street and we took up the whole of one side of this, the wall with all these records and they were all in folders in numerical and alphabetical order. There were four girls and eight men from the Sec First World War. They'd enlisted again, but they were B class, so they were put in records. Okay. And the, the 12 of us worked there together for about four years. And I just learned so much from those four, those 12, uh, eight men about the First World War, also learning about the Second World War. It was an eye opener. And we were still only very young, but we had to accept back the personal effects of anybody, that, any Victorian that was killed overseas or died in action, and they'd send back their dog tags and their pay book and maybe a watch and a photo of mum and dad or whatever they had on them, and we'd have to catalogue it, keep it, notify the next of kin and wait until they came in to collect these few meagre remains. And uh, it was a bit trying because it was very, very emotional. Passing over the worst, the next of kin. The worst was coming back from um, the New Guinea campaign because everything smelt mildew and dank and there'd often be dried blood specks on their pay book or the little the photos they had in their pocket. And my daughter and son-in-law lived in New Guinea for 13 years after the war and I could still smell that smell when I went up to see them. It just never goes out of your memory. But uh, it was grim, but I I did I appreciate what I, what I learned. I think I grew up in those four years. It would have. You were saying before that you had to keep records of people that were the enemy that lived yes, there? Yes, we kept all those. Is that a Japanese, same? Germans. Oh, the, oh, so they just, yes, they were Australians? They've been living but... here, maybe born here, but because they were descendants of. Yep. So we had all those records, records at our fingertips. Oh, yeah. There were lots of light-hearted times because one of the one of the eight fellows had been in an entertainment unit in the First World War and he'd go out at lunchtime and have a few drinks and then he'd come back and entertain us. <laughs> so there were lighter moments. That's, and, that's great. Yeah.